Professor, hello. We are glad to see you in Ukraine, and actually, we are glad that you find the possibility to come to share with your ideas uh, to us. And uh, we do believe that it will make a difference for our leaders here in Ukraine. And as you know, our country is passing now through reforms. We are like a after revolutionary society. Uh, we have a war, um, but still we're trying to do uh, our lives in our country better. And we are seeking, I think so, and we do believe here in the center of leadership that we're seeking for the new models of uh, efficient leadership in 21st century. Mm. So uh, um, my first question to you as an expert in, uh, in the field of leadership is uh, that so-called old models of leadership is uh, not working anymore in, in the modern world. Uh, and the question is why? Yeah, that's a good question. It's uh, the old model of leadership focuses excessively on the use of power and authority and dominance. And it's about getting people to follow you, follow your vision, and getting them to do what you want them to do. And it's authority-centric, meaning it focuses excessively on an individual mm -hmm. rather than a set of problems. And no one individual is smart enough, competent enough, capable enough to know what to do, how to do it, uh, let alone guide large groups of people to the correct solution. So why? Because the problems that of today uh, are excessively complex. They are shared interdependent problems, multidimensional problems, and so you really need leadership to be manifest by multiple individuals in multiple groups that uh, can surface the problematic realities and engage these diverse groups in problem-solving processes. So it takes the focus from a dominant individual onto a process of problem solving, change and creative work of bringing something new into existence. So you're managing processes that ultimately help people make sense of complex problems, generate solutions to these problems and create what is needed to actually make progress for organizations, institutions and communities. Mm -hmm. But if you know, if to think logically, um, almost anyone can see that this kind of paternalistic leadership, or as you call it in your books, a uh, big man or big woman leadership, sure. uh, is not working anymore. But why st still people are behaving in uh, old, inefficient models uh, while performing there on a leader's position? I mean, old habits die hard. <laughs> <laughs> You know, authority is central in our lives. It's, we experience it in the family, we experience it at school, wherever we go. Uh, authority is there. So there's no running away from authority. Authority will always be there in our lives in some way or another. So it's not about getting rid of authority, it's about distinguishing leadership from authority. Because they're not the same thing. Authority right. must provide very critical services. You need authority figures to protect a group, to determine the priorities of what we do, what we don't do, to determine who's in a group, who's out of a group, and to manage the, the problem solving of the group to some degree. So authority is needed. So we don't want to take that away. And particularly when dealing with a crisis, authority needs to step forward and help a group figure out you know, how to survive in that space. And, uh, but leadership is needed to help groups deal with the complexity of these challenges. It's stimulating a sense-making process so that we can respond to the changes in our environment. Now, as I said, old habits die hard, so we put a, an excessive burden on authority to figure that work out. And a lot of people want that kind of authority, whether it's political authority mm -hmm. or managerial authority. They gravitate to those positions and say, you know, pick me, choose me. I want to be the one that figures out how to do, deal with these challenges. I'll tell you what the problem is and what the solution is. This leads to populism around the world. Mm -hmm. These individuals either seduce others to follow them or others seduce them to be the great leader to take them to the promised land. 
I mean, groups can be very seductive and individuals can also be very seductive, but rarely does it work out well. And part of the reason it doesn't work out well, or why this tendency to look for a great figure, a dominant individual, even somebody who's somewhat heroic, to guide us, is because we're essentially tribal by nature. We all have this tribal instinct, this tribal impulse. What does that mean? It means that we value our identity groups, we find meaning in those groups, and there's a sense of purpose and community, safety and security in these groups. But in, all, in order to sustain these groups, even to invigorate these groups, you need an authority figure, somebody uh -huh. to be the coordinator, the representative, the ambassador for the group. And so that's always a tribal function, no matter where you go in the world, whether it's a modern organization, whether it's a community, whether it's a tribe, and I've lived with tribal groups in various parts of the world, they all have an authority figure. You look into history, every tribal group has an authority figure. So we are still tribal by nature, and we do look for a dominant individual to provide that coordination, that problem solving, and that protection for the group. So understandably, it's very easy for, for us to defer to authority. The problem is when we become excessively dependent on authority, we reduce our own capability, our mm -hmm. own creative capability, our own problem-solving cap uh, capability, our own sense of responsibility for the problems around us. So we neglect a lot and we give that burden of responsibility to an authority figure. And that's what tribal groups do. They say, well, we'll handle this, but the boss, the chief, the king, they'll handle that particular uh -huh. set of problems. So that tribal instinct is alive and well. And also, given the complexity of the problems we face today, it's a little overwhelming for people. And so it's beyond our individual capacity to make sense of this complexity. And the complexity generates intense anxiety, even fear, and occasionally conflict between groups. And so, naturally, we do look for a dominant individual to either make sense of the complexity for us, uh -huh. so we don't have to think too hard about it, or to fight the inevitable battles that are going to happen as, cl uh, as tribes clash up against one another as they compete either for resources or they have competing notions of progress, and those views of progress clash as they pursue their particular agendas. So, Yes, authority must play that function, but the tribal instinct is alive and well. And unless people understand really what leadership is, uh, and the importance of leadership in terms of sense-making, and building bridges and crossing boundaries to build partnerships to address these shared challenges, we will not be able to make progress. So we need to reinterpret leadership, reduce the, the, the focus on a dominant, powerful individual to show us the way and increase that sense of responsibility in uh, our communities, institutions, and certainly in politics as well. Mm -hmm. So you started to talk uh, already about the model of the old leadership, yes, so it's a, it's a person who can show the way, who can, uh, um, you know, encourage followers to, to follow the way, to follow the leader. Sure. Uh, and uh, this is understandable. Uh, the, the model is understandable and this model you can find in many books and uh, sure. in many business schools all over the world. But what is the new model? What is the difference between old understanding what the leadership uh, is and, and the new one? Well, getting people to follow you is once again, that's uh, the role of authority in a tribal context or the role of an authority figure in, in taking a group out to battle an enemy. Mm -hmm. you know, follow me and uh, I'll help you to win the battle. Or to follow me, I'll help you to deal with these set of problems. But if we conceive of, of, of leadership as nothing more than an activity, a motivational activity of getting people to follow you through the art of persuasion, uh, or seduction, or if that does not work through force, uh, you will not get very far. Now, imagine it as a parent. 
uh, as a parent, do you want your child to follow you? Most parents will say, no, I don't want my child to follow me. Well, then what's the indicator of success in terms of your leadership as a parent? If your child is following you, the, it probably means the child is excessively dependent on you and not thinking for themselves. The indicator of success in parenting, even if your child goes off the straight and narrow path and struggles with the problems in life, is that they learn, they grow, they develop, and they build this sense of responsibility that includes critical thinking, creative thinking, respect and consideration, and operate with a set of ethical and moral principles. I mean, that's the indicator of uh -huh. success and you as a parent can look back and say wow you know I've done a pretty good job even though it was a struggle along the way the same applies to leadership whether it's in politics or whether it's in uh, modern companies whatever that setting might be you're building a sense of responsibility that leads people go to go beyond the constraints of their boundaries even beyond the constraints of their notion of accountability if you think about accountability, it's an agreement. I'll do these one, two, three, or four activities. And every year you have a performance appraisal and somebody uh -huh, sits and holds uh -huh, you uh -huh. to account. Did you do one, two, three, and four? Uh, but people hide behind their accountabilities all the time. Because you may do one, two, and three, and four, but why didn't you do five, six, seven, and eight? Well, that's not in my job description, so I don't do that. So there's no sense of responsibility. Leadership is about getting people to be responsible, to go beyond the constraints of their accountability or beyond the constraints of their authority and actually tackle these shared, complex, messy problems that we face. So I look at leadership as the activity of activating this sense of responsibility, cultivating a sense of responsibility and stimulating the creative work that must be done to generate solutions to these complex problems. So at its essence, this new notion of leadership is essentially getting people to face reality. Realities that they don't want to face, or they're too complex to face, so you help, have to help them make sense of these notions of reality. And, uh, and not only, if you're going to be facing reality, you're facing dangers, yeah. potential dangers, threats, uh, uh, things that are flawed or broken, but you're also facing possibilities and, and, uh, and potential. And so in facing that, wow, there, there, there's a gap. Well, here's the reality, but here's where we're at. Now we must face another reality. We don't have the capability to address that problem. We don't have the capability to take advantage of that possibility. So we've got to build capability. We've got to transition our values. We've got to create new solutions. So addressing the gap between the status quo and the possibility uh, and bringing these two things closer, that's an activity of leadership. And leadership is also needed to address what I call adaptive challenges uh -huh. versus technical challenges. Technical challenges are routine challenges for very clear problems, uh, problems where you, you know the, what the problem is and you know what the solution is. So all you need to really do is motivate people to address that. Good management can handle that. So let's not call good management leadership. There's a role for good management in the same way that there's a role uh, for good authority. But leadership uh, is be, is, it's not like it's beyond or above that. It's just different from that. Management and, and authority are managing the everyday problems that we need to address leadership is more dealing with the unknown or the complex so the problem is not really clear you know you've got a problem but it's messy how do you frame it how do you know you're actually working on the right problem so it needs a lot of experimentation a lot of exploration a lot of trial and error to be able to figure these things out so you're stimulating a learning process and that's the thing with an adaptive challenge the essence of it is about learning. You're trying to generate an adaptation in the community or in the organization that elevates performance and creates a whole new possibility for action and accomplishment. 
And that's true in nature as well. Uh -huh. An organism has to make an adaptation to respond to the changes in the environment. If it does not succeed in making that adaptation, uh, eventually it will die. And in society, uh, organizations, they come and they go, they collapse. Societies and civilizations come and go, they eventually collapse unless they can make the critical adaptations in order to survive. And this activity of leadership, this is another important point, uh, this activity of leadership, it's, it's something you do, it, it, it's a process that you orchestrate. It's not a person. A person does it, yes, but it's not a person in the sense that uh, it's a position. It's not a leadership position, it's an authority position. And it, it's an activity that you do. It's like, you know, don't call yourself a runner unless you're actually running. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so, don't call yourself a leader unless you're actually exercising or practicing leadership. Just because you're the boss, you're not necessarily exercising leadership. And we all know a lot of bosses or a lot of politicians who don't exercise a lot of leadership. Or you might say they exercise bad leadership or fake leadership, counterfeit leadership. Yeah, you could say that, but they're not exercising real leadership. Real leadership mobilizes these people to tackle these difficult problems. The problem-solving work, the change in values and habits, and the creative work of bringing something into existence. And collectively, these kinds of challenges are what I call adaptive challenges. Yeah, great. You start to talk about running and runner, leader and leadership, and mm -hmm. I know that uh, some of your students from time to time asking you to give an example of the brilliant great leader and usually are not given such an example so you're giving them another answer so yeah i'd like you to share now this information with us uh why it's so hard to give a example of the leader yeah because you know we we all admire the man for all seasons the leader for all challenges unfortunately as you look into history or you look into the modern world, you do not find somebody that consistently provides leadership for all challenges. And there's so many different kinds of leadership challenges. You know, you have leadership in a time of conflict or crisis, leadership when things are going well, but then you hit a storm and then you know, what do you do in the storm? Do you hold steady? Do you advance? You have leadership uh, for challenges where you have to shift the values from one set of values to another. You have entrepreneurial leadership where you have to move out into the great unknown and make discoveries. You have conservative, protective leadership where you've got to hold the group and protect and maintain what you have. You have activist leadership where you have to wake people up, look, there's a problem, face the problem. And uh, so you have all these different kinds of challenges that organizations face, communities face, nations face. Uh, how can anybody have that leadership capacity to succeed in all contexts? Nobody really can. So the leadership needs to emerge from multiple people, through partnerships, through networks of partnerships. That's absolutely critical to be able to do that. And you know, if you look in the, into history, yeah, uh, and particularly uh, in the Western world, people talk about the great uh, Winston Churchill. Some outstanding movies about Churchill have come out over the last few years, and there's no doubt he's an intriguing individual who provided outstanding leadership during World War II with the Nazi onslaught to develop or to encourage and stimulate this strength of attitude and courage and uh, fortitude in the face of this challenge, that, boy, we've got work to do, and, uh, and we must face that work. And yet, nevertheless, you know, the great Churchill did a pretty appalling job as a young man when he was essentially the Minister of Defence and made decisions that led to the mass slaughter of British and Australian and New Zealand troops on the shores of Gallipoli uh, when they landed to fight the Turks. Uh, who uh, had partnered with the Germans to, uh, to, to fight the British. My grandfather was a part of that battle and, uh, and he certainly did not have much regard for Churchill. <laughs> and so it's tough to get it right repeatedly uh, in any context. So 
rather than exaggerate or deify or mythologize so-called great leaders, it's better to talk about them in a particular context or a moment when they rose to the, to the occasion. And you do see time and again ordinary people do some extraordinary things. They never planned for it. They never expected to be at the center of this challenge, but for whatever reason, they rise to that occasion. They provide what is needed. And then if they can walk away from the success and allow others to take it, that work on and take it to the next level, wonderful. Sometimes it's very difficult to walk away from the success. And uh -huh. people say, wow, you did such a great job there. Why you don't can you? Continue, yeah. You can continue, <laughs> great one. And eventually, you know, they don't live up to the expectation because it's a very difficult thing to pull off. So I don't like to talk too much about kind of these great individuals. Not to say that they're not out there, but they do that job in a moment uh -huh. in time. It's just like great organizations. Uh, you can talk about great organizations today, but will they be great tomorrow? You don't know. Yeah, we don't know. And what we do know is, so if you take the Fortune 100 list or the Fortune 500 list, say of 30 years ago, you know, only about 5% of those companies are even there today. Yeah, yeah. And so where are they? They've either merged with others or they've just disappeared, collapsed, gone by the wayside. It's very difficult to ensure sustainability of anything that we do. Yeah, plus we have such a corporate scandals as in Ron, for example. And before the scandal, they was quite famous and everyone was trying to be um, almost the same like them, you know, trying to uh, um, to say that they have a great leadership and, uh, and so on. And Precisely. So on. Like you take a company like Enron, the different business schools, at the height of its success, everybody was looking at Enron, how great it is. You know, it, its strategy, wow, they're so good at this, they're so good at that. Uh, the quality of its management, boy, we can learn a lot from how to manage innovation and, and, and strategy formulation and implementation. And the quality of its leadership at the higher levels, they're such visionary individuals. And while we're selling that myth and, and studying these case studies in business schools, this company was actually in a state of decay. It was a toxic culture that was poorly managed, very competitive, uh, and didn't have a moral center. Uh -huh. And eventually, they made too many grave errors, uh, strategic blunders, ethical blunders, and it came collapsing down and hit, it hit the ground very hard. And many people who talk about leadership or who sold the line that this was a model of excellence were very embarrassed by their excessive confidence in this as an institution and in its management to be the model of leadership. So uh, yeah, it, it's, and, and that's you know, one example, and we see it in, in many modern examples, and certainly during the financial crisis global financial crisis of a decade ago with some of the large American banks and also European banks that collapsed under the weight of that burden because they could not change fast enough or they did not listen to their clients, their customers, or even their internal uh, people who were dealing with these challenges like at Lehman Brothers who could say, hey, we're excessively leveraged uh, or invested in this particular strategy, there's danger here, we need to make a modification in strategy, but top management said, hey, we're making a lot of money, you know, who are you, what do you know? So people, these, uh, these truth tellers often get marginalized or oh, banished oh. To, the, to the dungeon in, in the basement of these companies. So it's not an easy thing to do. Which means with their KPI, everything was fine. Followers were following their leaders. The KPIs look good, the accountability yeah. statements. The strategy is okay. All yeah. good, great performance evaluations. Yes, but in the end, it's not working. And somehow. then you're, you're going off the cliff and it's like, wow, what happened? Yeah. yeah. So we're coming to the idea that um, leadership is more about being a change agent in the modern world. Yes, absolutely. And uh, sometimes we can uh, face the problems which are uh, interdependent pro uh, problem. We cannot solve it inside of our society. We need a society, another society, 
for solving such a problem. And sometimes uh, this society can be, for example, our competitors. Hmm. And we wouldn't like to, you know, to deal with them even in question of in the field of solving kind of complex problems. Sure. I'm just trying to understand if I'm, you know, um, I'm in the process of leadership in my company. And, uh, and I have, uh, I can see that there is a reality which mm. is dangerous for us, for my group. Yeah. And then I have to come back and somehow to explain that we need now to cooperate with our so-called enemy. Right. Um, how, to, how to do it practically, you know, because it's a, it's a, the boundaries are strong in such situation. And I'm afraid, you know, that my, my own people, you know, my own society will tell me, uh, you know, you are not leader anymore. Sorry, you know, the the reality you are facing for us mm -hmm. is too dangerous. We're afraid of it. We would rather find someone who will tell us, great again, and we will uh, choose this person as a leader. Sure. So, how to how to behave in such situation? Well, in the world of business, or even with nations, you know, we talk about the competitive advantage of nation or the, of nations, or the competitive advantage. Uh, of, uh, of businesses it's this is you don't want to relate to competition as the act of warfare you know Sun Tzu and the art of war yes it's a it's an insightful book about strategy uh, but it's not about defeating the enemy here uh, in a modern democracy or in open free markets it's Yes, you want to do things better than your competitor, but you also want healthy competition because they keep you on your toes. Uh -huh. And in the work of my colleague, Michael Porter at Harvard Business School, who is one of the great gurus on strategy, he talks about the importance of clusters. Uh -huh. you know, and, and clusters uh, are groups within kind of shared sectors and industries who share so many resources, you know, their, their staff, their employees, even their management uh, uh, moving in and out of different companies and, and, uh, and they're creating, and, uh, people leave one company and they create a very similar company. Uh, this keeps everybody on their toes. It, it actually brings everybody to a higher level of performance uh, rather than cutthroat do or die competition that is very unhealthy. And so you're redefining competition to collaboration for mutual benefit or win-win results. Uh -huh. Now, I'm not talking about na a, a naivete uh, in the face of these kinds of challenges. But whether it's in politics or business or, or education or whatever field, to be able to partner across boundaries and partner across disciplines and seek to build a, he a healthy relationship of mutual respect rather than destruction that can often lead to mutually assured destruction. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, that's a much better world for all of us and that's what we try to instill in our children as, as a way to, uh, to not simply survive in the world but to thrive in the world. Uh, there's nothing but benefit to come from that. Next question, since we started to talk about boundaries and about, right. about clusters uh, who are actually making boundaries uh, smaller and thinner, yeah? And more permeable and, as well. Yeah, and they're building bridges. So what is the role of the leadership in, uh, in working with boundaries and why it's, so, uh, why it's so important to work with boundaries in, in a global world for, for the leaders? Yeah, boundaries are everywhere. I mean, they're in nature, they're in communities, you mean you have a geographical boundary, uh, they're in tribes and groups of all sorts, you have identity boundaries, ethnic boundaries, age boundaries, religious boundaries. Boundaries are interesting because they separate one group from another, but they also generate a sense of identity and purpose and allow for coordinated activity to take place. So there's good reason for boundaries. And, but a boundary is also a frontier. It's an opportunity for exploration. If you can go beyond the boundary, you can make discoveries. 
we can no longer solve these complex problems within, from within our boundaries. In other words, we've exhausted our repertoire of solutions, of technique. And so you now need to cross boundaries and interact with other groups to say, well, hey, you're a part of the problem, therefore you need to be a part of the solution. We're a part of the problem. We do want to participate in the solution. So you, we have to connect multiple groups and stimulate this problem-solving work or uh, this work of uh, making an adaptation because the adaptation is in, needs to occur in our relationship. There's something about how we're relating that's only making the problem worse and so unless we address this relationship we're not going to make any advancement. It's not easy for us to cross boundaries because you cross boundaries, uh, hey that other group may not like you, they may, not, they may be suspicious of you, they may not trust you. So you've got to build a relationship and a healthy relationship. Not only that, your own group may wonder, yeah. hey, where are you? Where, where are you going? Why are you talking with them? You know, you should be back here with us. So that you've got this body of leadership work of being able to communicate to your people back then that we all have to go over and get to know them and, and to appreciate how they see the problem and how we see the problem. And, uh, and then we can begin to make the adaptations to address these problems. Or else we've got separate silos. Even in an organization, any business you go into and you ask people what are the, what's the biggest problem around here, they'll talk about the silos. Uh -huh. you know, these uh -huh. different departments, oh nobody works well and we don't share information and we're supposed to work together but it's a real struggle to work together. That's a manifestation of the tribal impulse but it's also the power of boundaries to kind of hold us and to separate us. So on one hand, you've got to be crossing boundaries. Another leadership task is to expand the boundary, to make the boundary more permeable so information can come in. Uh -huh. There's a bit, you need a bit more diversity in there to stimulate creativity. And sometimes the leadership work is to break up the boundary because the boundary is no longer effective. It doesn't make sense. It's holding counterproductive and beliefs and activities. So the work of leadership, you've got to break it up or invent some new uh, practices and because the old mythology, the old beliefs, the old superstitions are just leading people not to deal with the demands and challenges of the world today. Their head is in the sand and uh, the group can be very volatile and vulnerable uh, if they persist in holding on these kind of beliefs. And there's another body of leadership work around boundaries is sometimes you have to leave the boundary, the security and the safety of the boundary, to go to the frontier, then beyond the frontier, in a voyage of discovery, uh, and exploration, and experimentation, to discover new solutions. Entrepreneurs do that. You move out into the great unknown. And when you're in the great unknown, you don't have the solution, it's very difficult for people uh, in that space because many people want to give up, but they want to flee, they want to go back to the world they know. But hey, we don't have the solution yet. Well, yeah, but can you promise we'll get the solution? I don't know. We've got to continue to experiment, to continue to explore. So going beyond the boundaries, transcending boundaries is critical. We also no, I mean, all of us experience the inevitable conflicts between groups in the world today. In our communities, uh, in our sectors, in our professions, and certainly the, conflict, the conflicts between ethnic groups and also the conflicts between nations. Because of competing notions of progress or competition for turf or control, whatever it might be. In, in this country, you're experiencing this as we speak. Yes, there comes a point when the leadership work is to be able to build bridges. Bridges of collaboration and cooperation and understanding. And building bridges is kind of healing wounds and being able to, to put the resentment and the, the anger and, and the disappointment uh, to the side. And to put the past into the past so it doesn't get played out again. Not easy work to do, very demanding, difficult work. It's difficult to build the bridge, then it's difficult to get people onto the bridge and then crossing and connecting uh, because the danger is there's always somebody who wants to blow up the bridge or eventually kind of retreat back, you know what, I don't like this bridge building stuff.
<coughs> so managing that process is a huge leadership challenge. Also connected to bridge building is simple, this more simpler activity of reducing the mystery of who people are. Maybe it's not overt conflict, but there's just different groups doing their own thing. Well, hey, maybe if we got to know one another a little bit better and reduced either the, the suspicion or the mystery, we might find something in common that allows us to come together to create something of value that adds advantage for us and for you and the larger systems that we're a part of. So, in this kind of these, this, this tribal world, and believe me, I mean, even in a university, of which I am a, have been a part of for most of my working life, uh, groups are a mystery to one another. You know, the, the economists do their things, the, the historians do their things, the mathematicians and, 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 uh, do their thing, and uh, the business school does its thing, and the school of public health stat does its thing. I mean, we're all kind of masters of, of a, a domain <laughs> of knowledge, and we kind of dig deep into that domain. And we're a little bit of a mystery to one another, given our language and our tribal rituals and ceremonies. It's actually a wonderful activity when we, a bunch of us come together from different backgrounds and disciplines and say, so how do you think about this problem? Hmm, huh, that's interesting, I never thought of it like that. And then you broaden perspective and develop a richer understanding of the problems that we face. So universities have to do that. Uh, Communities have to do that. In government, we have to do that. Religious institutions need to do that. So, uh, nations need to do a much better job of that. So, this is the work of, of leadership in this modern age, and, and we neglect that work at our own peril. What can you say about Ukraine from this perspective? Because you're here for one week, and I do understand that one week is not enough to make uh, solid conclusions about the country, sure. but still maybe... Uh, you already mentioned uh, something about our boundaries, sure. how strong they are, and how Ukrainian leadership do do uh, well or not really well with the crossing of these boundaries, with the building bridges. Maybe some challenges which you think uh, um, Ukrainian leaders have here in, in our country. Sure. You know, I've only been here <coughs> a week, but I've been an observer on the sidelines. You know, I watched from a distance what happened in 2004 then again in 2014 and I've always had an interest in the Ukraine and I've read about the Ukraine and uh, its experience uh, under uh, uh, Soviet communism and I grew up in Australia and we had a lot of Ukrainian immigrants in Australia and, uh, and one of my best friends was, was of Ukrainian oh, descent. Really? Absolutely. And uh, so, you know, the Ukraine, when Ukrainians weren't, weren't so foreign to us. Yes, it was this strange land way out there, mm -hmm. but <laughs> over time you meet enough Ukrainians around the place who are actually doing wonderful things and, uh, uh, and, uh, and contributing to wherever they go. So, and, and in coming here, it, it's like, Yes, this is a part of the old kind of uh, Soviet uh, uh, empire, but I see a lot of people with imagination, with, with, with courage, with uh, uh, the desire to see change in this country. I mean, together we've been out and we've met you know, 16, 17, 18-year-old students and we've had the chance to speak to them. and. Wow, they want to get out and be change agents in the world, and they're learning how to be change agents. And we've met politicians and uh, from different parties, and who also want to see change, and they don't want to see the country fall back in the old ways, or they don't want to be excessively dependent on or promote these big man authority figures who have a ton of money and can, you know, buy their way into politics and uh, and, and promote solutions that they think are right but are not actually going to work so we're meeting and in the university of this very university that we're speaking in right now we're meeting outstanding people so it tells me something that there are change agents here and there are potential change agents here there's a lot of energy for change 
And the very fact that there are so many problems facing this country, problems that are a, leg a legacy of the old communist days, problems that are a product of trying to figure out how do we respond and succeed in this age of globalization, problems associated with trying to figure out what, even before our communist days, in terms of our history, our legacy, our culture, our values, what's absolutely precious that we hold on to and that we take with us into the future, and what is it we can either modify and, or may need to discard because it's insufficient or it's not helpful in taking us forward. And developing a new story of who you are, a new aspiration that includes and recognizes the past, but it but instills or generates an excitement for particularly this new generation to say, wow, this is the new Ukraine, I want to be a part of that. That's very important leadership work that needs to be done as well. The narrative, creating a narrative and and spreading that narrative and ensuring that the multiple groups can see themselves in that narrative, that story that is needed, that's aspirational, that is inclusive, not exclusive for the different groups, that people can see, yeah, I want to be a part of that and it requires my problem-solving capacity, my creative capacity, my energy, my hard work to make it a reality. And often in countries that kind of struggle or fall back into conflict, it's not uncommon. Uh, well, bank research actually kind of shows this. It's not uncommon for countries that have a lot of conflict. They may get out of it for a while, but within you know seven to ten years, they can fall back into it very fast because they become excessively dependent on a dominant authority figure to figure things out, but that individual does, doesn't do a good job, does a poor job. They fail to build the political capacity or the capacity to make democracies work that require a lot of problem solving and creative work. So by virtue of being neglectful or by virtue of promoting their interests of their group at the expense of other groups, groups get left behind, the conflicts re-emerge and groups fall back. So you have to be very attentive to the needs of all these different groups. And some will have to ha sustain certain losses. Uh, you're going to have to let go of certain things. So managing the process of loss becomes just as important as managing the attention on the aspiration. And as I said earlier, no one individual can do that alone. The church has a role to play. The, uh, the community organizations and civil society has a role to play. The universities and, and, and the business community has a critical role to play. And government, no doubt, has a central role to play. And the politicians need to be able to provide real leadership, not counterfeit leadership, and uh, to ensure that these visions turn into positive realities and the losses are sustained well and you're reducing the negative aspects of these, of the tribal impulses that uh, will always be there. So we are coming to the point where we've started today interview that we need new kind of leaders, mm. we need new paradigm of uh, what leadership actually is. Sure. So the next question is how to develop such kind of leadership, you know. Um, you are well known uh, in the world as a consultant and as a coach of many outstanding mm -hmm. leaders like your students um, um, then became uh, first people you know in their countries such as uh, Mongolia president yeah. and president of Madagascar and mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken you've been consulting him for four or five years yeah. uh, like uh, uh, for a quite long time uh, you've been coaching uh, Prime Minister of Singapore mm -hmm. um, uh, both of them again if I'm not mistaken um, so what, what are the main points in, the, in developing of leadership, of this new type of leadership? Yeah, it, it's... Well, might I say, even though I've worked with a few prime ministers and presidents uh, who have enormous challenges, uh, I actually enjoy working with 
social leaders, community leaders, youth leaders, and business leaders, people from any walks of life. I mean, whether you're the president of the country and you've got a set of leadership challenges, or you're running a school and you're a principal, we all, the, the, the challenges obviously in, com, in terms of complexity are different, but we're dealing with people. And they're all people challenges in varying ways. And so to build leadership capacity, you're really trying to help people understand human nature. That means understanding psychology, why people think the way they do, how they reason about problems, and how they understand themselves and their role in terms of either contributing to problems or in trying to provide leadership. So there's a lot of personal insight work that you have to do to take on this activity we're calling leadership if you don't have self-knowledge in terms of your strengths and weaknesses, mm -hmm. your biases, <coughs> your attachments and loyalties and sense of obligation because we can become our own worst enemy and our own oh, yeah. thinking and behavior can get in the way. The most complicated enemy. <laughs> our most complicated enemy, no doubt about that. So a lot of insight into the self is very important. And then, of course, you need insight into human nature in the context of group behavior. Uh, because the moment you start to throw a few people together, a group dynamic emerges and the tribal impulse is unleashed. And uh, wonderful things can happen in groups, enormous creativity in groups. But groups can turn ugly very fast mm -hmm. and turn either on themselves or turn on others. So there's a lot to understand about group behavior and the interactions within groups and between groups that one needs to understand. Uh, so that becomes very important. And then it's also important to understand and appreciate larger systemic dynamics that include multiple interacting groups, but well, you're also adding technological disruptions and innovations and dynamics and economic systems as well. It's like, wow, there's, there's a lot of stuff to be looking at. But you have to understand how the systemic forces and currents are coming to bear to impact and generate problems at a local level. But also, to uh, th these forces and cur currents can be harnessed to support you in your leadership work as well. So you need a broad perspective. And then you need to have this micro perspective to be, have attention to detail. And to have this micro perspective, you need to be able to go down to, to see the essence of the problem on, on how people think about the problem, how they relate to the problem, what's, how do they, what's, what's their story about the problem. So you're going to the grassroots to observe not only how people uh, uh, connecting to the problem and think and feel about the problem, but you're also looking to see whether your leadership work is having any impact or not. And that helps you then to modify your behavior, your style, your approach, your interventions. And then you've got to get back and have this broad systemic view again. And so, and so building this kind of capacity and also the capacity to be multidimensional in style and approach so you're able to provide the appropriate interventions for a particular context because a different context or a different set of challenges requires a different set of interventions. And if you can only intervene or you only have the one style, you will not be able to get very far. Now maybe it's difficult to be multidimensional, then if that is the case, you better have people around you who can compensate for what you do not have or what you cannot do well mm -hmm. and give them the space to provide the leadership that actually advances the work of change. Oh, it's so hard to do. It's hard to do, but it's exciting to do. And so if you take on this work with the spirit of adventure and learning and you develop this reflective capability, it's, it's, it's personal development. And it's personal development that can actually make a difference in the world and there's no greater joy Sure. Then making a difference in a community, in your team, in an organization, or if you get into politics for a nation or in the relationship between nations, what better work is there to do? So it, it's, it's honorable work and we need to rise to the occasion to do it honorably.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. And uh, in the end of our interview, I would like you to wish a few words to Ukrainian leaders. <laughs> Ukrainian leaders. Uh, one, for those who think they are the leaders, uh, think twice. Really look, are you exercising leadership or not? Or is it nothing more than the appearance of leadership or the expression of counterfeit leadership? If such is the case, step back, allow others to step forward. Uh, for Ukrainian, for Ukrainian leaders who really want to contribute, take the time to develop the leadership capacity of other people. There's a lot of people who can do leadership work, but often they're blocked from doing that leadership work. Be bold in your thinking, have an aspiration that's going to make a difference for the Ukraine. And, and see your work as stimulating the problem solving and the creative work of your institutions. Uh, not, don't see it as simply to get what you think needs to be done or advancing your interests at the expense of other groups. Uh, you do can uh, and find value and, and, uh, and grow and, and develop as you express your leadership work. But the ultimate indication of success is are the lives of ordinary Ukrainians getting better? If they're not, it indicates there's an absence of leadership. And your leadership is not only internally with your own people and the multiple groups that make up the country of the Ukraine, but it's also externally into the larger environment and the international community to be able to support you in the adaptive work of addressing all these complex problems. So there's plenty of leadership work to go around. And let's make sure everybody has an opportunity to get in, get their hands dirty and to contribute with these challenges. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you one more time for your visit to our country. Thank you, Andrew. It's been great being here. And um, see you hopefully next year again in Ukraine. Very good. Thank Thanks you. very much. <laughs>